so we're now going to um, cover a little bit about viruses, right? I'm not going to give a full virus lecture here. So if we look at one of the first few plagues uh, in, within the Bible, right? Um, one of them is called the plague of Korah, right? In, in Numbers 16, and, and uh, there was there were numbers given. So I'm not going to talk about the the, the the kind of reason to why there was a plague and so on and so forth, but I'm going to just go talk about num the numbers in numbers, yeah? So kind of over uh, the circuit breaker, I, I made some calculations on, on what is the percentage. So we, we know that uh, if we, if we calculate it, it's around 3.9% uh, within a very short period of time, uh, within the uh, context of this uh, account, right? And then the other, the other plague is, uh, David's census, right? David counted the soldiers, and he was he was uh, given a choice, right, by God, right? You you can see that the choices were three years more of famine, or three three months of enemy attack, and three years of pestilence. And David chose uh, three very clearly that he rather falls into the hand of God than to the hand of men, and and uh, th it was all recorded in one Chronicles twenty one, and also in Second Samuel twenty four. So uh, uh, the, I, mean, I know some people argue about the numbers, but the, the reason was because the famine was already ongoing to an extent. And uh, the calculation of this, uh, I took the numbers, I calculated how many were killed, how many died. Uh, we are talking about a, a percentage of 6.4% within just three days. It's a very fast acting virus. Or, well, it may not be a virus. It, we, we simply don't know what the agent was, right? So, but the, whether it, it doesn't really matter what is it. Some people say it's a bacteria because they say, uh, you know, it's hot, it's humid, it's probably going to be a bacteria. Some people say it's virus, but it doesn't really matter at this point. But let's talk about the lessons that we can learn from there, right? Um, so Aaron, of course, stood between the living and the dead in Numbers 48. He, he, he made sure that um, he, he was kind of being the barrier in that case, right? And for David's case, how did, how did they end? In David's case, he pleaded with the Lord for mercy to spare the people and for ownership onto his own and his father's house, right? Now, there wasn't a situation where he said, well, but why me? You know? And all I really did was just count the people. Um, one thing is very clear, right? That even though um, if, if you look at 1 Chronicles, you know, Satan roused David to sin, it was not a plague. I want to be very clear, it was not a plague that you cast out in the name of Christ, uh, you don't exorcise the, the the virus or the plague in that sense, and 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 I I know if if you look at some of the um, news, you have so-called Christians pastor uh, exorcising, you know, try casting out the COVID nineteen in the name of God. Uh, no, right? So so I want to be very clear on this part. So let us look at uh, some numbers. I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories like I mentioned, but we're going to look at some numbers, right? Uh, I don't have the latest. I did it a few days ago. We are talking about at this point um, over almost a year since it started, more than a, slightly more than a year since it started, as far as we know, uh, in the late 2019. That's why it's called COVID 19. Uh, this is the current rate of mortality that we have. And the second number uh, are those of the people who are infected. And it is already causing a huge mess uh, in, in world economies, in, in church attendance, in uh, many other factors, right? Every part of life is affected. But my, my reason of talking about all of these plagues and giving the numbers is because we have one that's going to come, and many more that's going to come in the future, and we know, right? Uh, if, you look, if you look at Revelations, they talk about the fourth seal taking out one quarter, right? And then the sixth trumpet taking out one third of mankind. And, uh, and, 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 so, and men being scarcer than gold, right? Um, so we are talking about worse times to come, and so the question that we have to ask ourselves at this point is what is your foundation and what is your theta? Now, science may give us a bit of idea how, how this can go into global, right? For example, a very old article showed about how dust storms could spread deadly diseases, how the winds can do it, how desert dust can, can have implications for human health. There are a lot of possibilities for all of this to, to go, whether it's bacteria or viruses, and so on and so forth. But, you know, whatever it is, um, I'm not here to 
be a doomsday prophet or in that sense. I'm here to tell you that, you know, this is not the worst, but then again, we this reminds us that we need to go back to our Bible. We need to go back to our understanding of things. So if you have a question why God, why a good God will allow bad things to happen, well, these are the answers, right? The Bible is very clear. So we need to be able to discern the spirits that we're talking about. And I'm going to show you some, some so-called scientific evidences of a lot of things in the past. And, and this is where we need to have strong ability to discern. In fact, one of the, the exposed uh, problems of this virus is people's lack of discernment, right? Uh, even in some of the people in, in, in uh, professionals, there's a lack of discernment in a lot of cases. There was a very interesting article around 2008 that talks about the origin of the Old Testament plagues, right? And they, how, how they link together. Well, it's a very nice read, and some of it is very likely to answer. Like, first of all, you have algae blooms, right? They call it algae blooms for the water turning to blood, and then, of course, your, your, your frogs then came out, and then when they die, of course, you have flies. And it's a very nice order, uh, and, and, and God can work within uh, his natural means, because don't forget, the natural world is created by God. It does not necessarily always have to be supernatural, but there are supernatural events like a virgin birth, right? So uh, there have been attempts, but if you actually look at it fully, you will find that not all the things fit, and therefore we have to reject it. Something like the water canopy theory, something like a big full-grown dinosaur being put in. And there are more to come, right, in, 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 in the world, right? Even, even at this point in time, there are tons of deadly viral diseases, right? HIV, hepatitis B, and many of them are actually pandemic, uh, kind of classified as pandemics, just that they don't spread so fast. And many, any of this could be used, there could be a new one, we simply don't know. So I, I will be very, very skeptical of any scientist or any uh, theologian who, would, who can tell you what the revelation plagues are going to be. We simply don't know. So let's not make assumptions on that. So I'm going to talk to you in general about what viruses do, right? And I'm going to start with a very, very uh, interesting passage. If you, if you look at Deuteronomy, right? And uh, not forgetting that the Exodus happened uh, between 1386 to 1346 BC, BC, um, right, that, that 40 years, uh, we're talking about written records of 3,000, at least 3,000, or close to 3,300 to 3,400 years ago. And the Bible is showing its timelessness in this, right? So if you look at here, Deuteronomy 23, right, and uh, talking about cleanliness, right, um, they, they talk about using uh, how to get rid of human uh, excrement in a, in a clean way, right? And in Leviticus, there are plenty of Leviticus rules talking about how the plague come again, what you should do, right? You have to separate. You have to separate. You have to, uh, you know, take out these um, so-called unclean things out of the city to an unclean place. And then if you look at the end of this, uh, around uh, Leviticus 47, 14, 47, you see it talk about wash his clothes, eat in the house, shall wash and wash and wash and wash. If you think about the sensibility of this, you're going to say, well, they are, they are in the wilderness, right? There's so much washing to do all the time, right? So, you know, this shows, if you think about it from a, from a human perspective, it's not possible to come up with these rules and laws. It has to come from God, because only God is timeless. And if you look at, again, uh, Leviticus 5, 2, right? If, or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it's a carcass or unclean beast, or carcass of unclean cattle, or any creeping, unclean, creepy thing, uh, you know, he shall be unclean, right? So there's a, there's a lot of cleanliness here, and if you look at the whole Leviticus 15, body discharges are considered unclean. There is a lot of washing and instructions to bathe, right? So uh, while people, millions of people, are wa walking in the wilderness with no, not like today we go to the washroom, we turn on the tap, they don't have this kind of conveniences. The laws of God at that time, given at that time, was way ahead of his time. Because if you compare with the US FDA instructions, it's always about washing. It's always about avoiding contacts, avoiding crowds, making sure there's a barrier, making sure there's distancing, making sure there's this and that, right? So 
I, I, I think this is very obvious proof that Bible is inspired. It was ahead of its time on this. So this is kind of like to address anyone who says the Bible is a very old book because we are following the very same rules and guidelines given around 3,300 years ago. So uh, there are many viruses, uh, as we know today, uh, on the planet, right? You see how you sneeze, the droplets go a bit, go a bit. And uh, you, in many of these droplets, which is why we have to wear masks during this period of time when you're interacting with people, and the viruses are extremely small, right? But you know what is interesting? Scientists ha have not decided whether the virus is a living or a dead thing. They don't classify it living because it cannot replicate by itself. It has to replicate only when it's in a host. So that's why they don't really consider it as a living thing per se. But you see, when this is how viruses can, can, can spread, right? They, they are very, very small, so they, can, they are so light that they can float in air for a good period of time. And uh, they are very specific, right? So for example, in all of these bits, they have to find a lock and key. It has to unlock on the cell, and then it, it cannot infect other types of cell. It can only infect specific types of, uh, let's say if it's, if it's HIV, it only attacks white blood cells. It doesn't attack hair cells. It doesn't attack uh, skin cells as far as we know, right? And once inside the cell, you know, uh, there is this. But I want you to marvel, really, how we are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and of course, there are also debates uh, about how could God create such a, such a horrible thing. Uh, and, and there are also even a lot of discussions on what the viruses probably were doing before the fall, before it was meant to bring diseases to men. But this is, um, we, we have to be careful that the viruses are so complex. The smallest, one of the smallest being, uh, organisms in the world that we know of today are incredibly complex. And this is the process of the DNA and the or RNA of the virus going into the cell's nucleus and, and doing its job, right? Rep, uh, copying, rep, replicating, and so on and so forth. But then it has to come back out. It then forms and creates other viruses. And this is how, at the molecular level, uh, something so tiny infiltrated your cell, okay, and started to make more copies of itself. So you see, it forms and then it releases and then it goes into uh, the, the rest of and infects and affects the rest of the body cells and that's how it replicates right uh, it can be it can be within um, uh, the lungs it can be within the intestines and it can be then uh, released when you breathe out and so on and so forth so you know it's very it's, it's amazing that 3,300 years ago there were very clear separation between cleanliness and not and the virus can can expand exponentially um, in, within the human body or within its infection very, very fast, as you can see. And that's how, um, you know, sometimes your white blood cells grab the uh, virus and, and they start clearing up. So we do have an immune system, we do have this system. And I'm just giving you a very sneak peek because this is many, many years of study, uh, many, many years of research to, to uncover how the body works. And uh, whether we will actually understand everything is a different, it's a, it's a, it's a question that no one can really answer. So these viruses are extremely small. They, can, they, are, they are plant viruses, they are animal viruses, and they are human viruses. They can be beneficial, they can be very bad for you, right? Uh, there's a huge diversity in the genomic material and people classify them differently. I'm not going into the full, but this is how small we're talking about, right? So on the rightmost is the human hair strand, right? Uh, a human hair strand. And uh, I don't know if you can see a coronavirus is somewhere around here, um, at the, at the third, third from the left. That's how small it is, right? Um, and so if you magnify the cor coronavirus uh, to the size of having the hair being of that large size, and, and uh, there are even smaller viruses than the coronavirus that, that we're so familiar with right now. And these are how the differences that it has. Um, and so they are classified based on their size and shape. And uh, it's very kind of symmetric. Some of them are very symmetrical. Some of them are very um, uh, kind of geometrically uh, inspiring in a sense, right? If you, if you look at how, uh, how all of them are like. And of course, the, the one on the top row, the one on the extreme right is uh, closest to what we have at this point in time, right? 
and that's why we call it corona because uh, it looks like it has crowns and so on and so forth. And, and these are very small things that has caused a lot of problems for us, right? And of course, uh, if you look at how they are formed, uh, it's quite, quite, quite interesting and very unique. They are very, very uh, kind of varying in size and shape here, yeah? Uh, if you look at the bacterial fart, which is the second one, you know, it looks like an alien, um, alien ship and then it actually binds to a, to a, to a cell and then it injects its DNA in. And you know, the third one, the flu, right, is uh, kind of what's bothering us a lot of times and, and so on and so forth. And so they have very diverse shape and sizes. Studies attempt to kind of study them mathematically and find that there's a geometric design. And you know, in some way, sometimes, uh, for me, right, for me, when I look at the Esplanade, to me, it's virus uh, design inspired, right? Because the Esplanade shell looks a bit like this to an extent, like a, like a durian. So if you, if you think about all of this and you think about the differences on all of them, it's very difficult to go and find a common, so-called common ancestor for all of these viruses and I'm going to give you more evidence about this. Uh, recently, we also did some work where we show how part of the HIV uh, virus uh, can attach. And you look at the, the bottom, I'm, I'm just going to show you the pictures at the bottom, and you can see how the geometric uh, shape occurs. So that's an order. It's not random, it's not disordered. And really, uh, all of this, sometimes when you, you look at the discoveries and you look at how the pictures of how they look, and what they do, you really have to, you know, acknowledge that the, the invisible things of him and invisible things are highlighted because the invisible things uh, is not only the spiritual world, but also the viruses in that sense, because you don't see them, right? You can't see them. And they really testify to the power of God, that such that we really are without excuse. So, so the, all of life, all of life as we know it, is DNA, RNA, proteins. RNA is what is in the, 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 some of the vaccines right now, right? Um, the Pfizer vaccines, the Moderna vaccines, they use RNA. Um, but all of life as we know it have a, have a rule, right? There's, a, there's an order, DNA to RNA to proteins. And I'm just going to show you a quick video of how all of this works. So this is like a cell, right? And, and how... Uh, how you get from this stage to the, that stage, and this is considered like the like the law, right, of of what we call about life. And within the cell, you have this complex structure, right? It's like almost like different cities and different departments, right? Uh, or within a building, if 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 you must, right, within a building, and then you have your chromosomes, which we are so familiar uh, in terms of uh, how male and female is also dictated by chromosomes and how your DNA falls, um, and you look at all of this DNA, this complication is just on four letters, right? A, G, C, and T. And they form your gene, right? And that's how you get, how, how the word gene, of course, came from the Greek, and, and, and you might have heard, right? Uh, Monogene, right? Uh, the word gene, right? Uh, came, from, came from that word, and is hereditary in that sense, right? And so, so A, G, C, T, uh, but when you make RNA, you have U, right, instead of T. But don't worry about all this. I'm not going to give you a quiz at the end of this session. But it's just to uh, let you appreciate that all of these things is extremely highly complex. And, you know, you want to talk about chance forming them without any intelligent design. It's, uh, I'll give you, of course, more evidence about this um, later on, that they don't happen by themselves. It's very hard for it to happen by itself, right? So uh, this is the whole process of the RNA leaving the nucleus, for those of you who can remember your biology, right? And then it's made into proteins by this structure here. And, you, you know, there's also a control mechanism because you pretty much have the same genes between, um, say, on your nails and on your, um, say, on your skin, right? But you don't grow nails everywhere, right? So certain genes are turned on, certain genes are turned off. Uh, so there is also a control regulation, right? So it's, you have the same gene throughout the whole, you have the same DNA throughout the whole body, more or less, but you don't always turn it on. So there is also a control mechanism. 
And I, I'm, I really want you to kind of appreciate the difficulty of this system, system happening by itself and the, the order, there's an order to how things happen. It's not random. Um, and if it doesn't follow the correct order, it will not be done, okay? And this is a protein and it can form your hair, it can form your nails, it can form antibodies, it can form anything and, and what is generic, right? And that's how, how the system works. But if you look at viruses back, uh, there are classifications on viruses apart from the shape and structure, right? There's a bit of, is it double-stranded? Is it DNA? Is it RNA? And which part of the RNA it is, okay? So COVID-19 falls into uh, Baltimore's classification four, but there's actually seven. So they all start with different beginnings. DNA, RNA, they start with different parts of the RNA as well. So this is the kind of an overall summary. Of course, again, you're not necessary to remember all of this. Um, it's just to show you that it is impossible for the virus to have a common ancestor. Okay, that, that's the message that I want to bring across. You cannot have the same common ancestor because they follow different paths and different ways of going. Because then you're going to say, which one's the first? That, is it number group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven? How and when and what are the intermediate selection pressures that are, are present to select for that kind of evolving, right? So it doesn't happen. So I, I mean, I'm just going to uh, roughly show you that it's impossible for even uh, the most expert evolutionist uh, virologist to come and tell you which virus type could come first. There is no way to know because viruses is a perfect example of how the whole evolution will fall apart. It's far too complex, even though it's that small, and it cannot happen before having cells because then they cannot replicate. They cannot fit the evolutionary tree. And so even for creation believing scientists, they tell you what the, what the origins of the virus are. It's very difficult. Okay, at this point in stage, no one can tell you what a virus was before the fall, what its role is, and so on and so forth, because they are just too diverse. Okay? And, and, and there's a lot of so-called evidence from uh, this uh, secular scientist that showed that HIV uh, mutates and uh, the evidence of it being drug resistant showed that it is um, evolving. But you know, uh, part of my work, we work on the computational study of HIV, we don't actually touch the virus in that sense, we use computers to study the DNA, and we have found that uh, there are rules within the virus. So who imposes all these rules? Who governs these rules? Right? There are rules in the mutations that can happen within the HIV virus uh, that it doesn't change in kind. You see, HIV is a 40, 40 year virus, right? we know about it for about 40 years. We have never seen it turn into something else uh, other than HIV, right? And most of the mutations that happen makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. Of course, there are beneficial mutations, but they don't happen often enough to make something change drastically that evolutionists will claim. Uh, of course, I understand this is very technical. Unless those of you who are in the field, you might appreciate, but feel free to go and read the paper. But my point is uh, we have good evidence to show that even without selection pressure, certain things just do not happen. The question that evolutionists like to propose then, why not give it a long time? Anything is possible, right? So we, they say the Earth is 14.5 billion years. Let's go with 14 for easy calculation purposes, right? Say there are 10, okay, so 10 to the power of 80. There's no name for that number, right? So there's 80 zeros after the after the, uh, uh, the, the 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 one, so it's eighty zeros after the one. There's no number. It's not your bank account. It's not my bank account. It's not all our bank accounts combined together. That's for sure. That's that number of atoms in the universe. So let's give that you can perform a po an experiment every millisecond. Forget about second. Let's go with millisecond, um, and you do every atom an experiment to form life. This is a number that you will get. Right? You have to time type this into your calculator. And um, I, as, as you know, I'm, I'm here, I can't type calculator. So if some of you can help, that would be great. Um, 
Anyone has a calculator to try and key this in? Right. If you if you can give me the answer, I, I'll be very very grateful. But well, fortunately, this is a pre-prepared talk, right? So actually, I, I do have the answer. The answer is actually error. You're not going to be able to get it on your calculator uh, because it's a number that's too big. But if you do it manually, you can get four times four point four with one hundred zeros behind the the the, the, the one. Okay. Uh, that's a very big number, and so it's telling you the chance of that happening is extremely, extremely small. You know your ATM cards, your bank, your your PIN number, right? Uh, you know you set it up, right? Unless your password is one two three four five six, then it, it it's not going to be easily hacked. And uh, why the bank accepts, or rather the machine accepts your number, uh, is because they think that by getting that number by chance is extremely small, right? And that number is a lot of zeros smaller than this number. Okay, so there's some inconsistency there. So if we talk about protein, right? If you go by uh, everything being present, everything being correct for, for protein formation, uh, and that you can form by, by themselves, so you have 20, because there are 20 amino acids to the power of 300, or essentially 10. Sorry, a number, num a number with 390 zeros behind the one for a protein to form randomly by itself. This far exceeds me trying to hack into your ATM uh, card number or your password and so on and so forth. These are numbers that are not possible at this stage. And so even if you assume that you have these uh, experiments, you, even with 14 billion years, everything being present, everything being fine, millisecond, you are not going to have even one protein or gene forming by accident, statistically speaking, okay? So if you go about DNA, is 540 zeros behind the one. This is impossible odds, okay? Impossible odds. To make it worse, if you think about it, uh, just simply putting DNA uh, together or proteins together doesn't mean they're going to get a functional protein because if you're fixing a computer, let's say your computer uh, was caught in the rain, right? Fixing the software part doesn't solve the problem because the problem is at the hardware, right? Maybe some things are rusted and so on and so forth. So you're trying to form life by putting things together is not really going to work, right? Because you're fixing things at the wrong, what we call conceptual level. So let's say you're, you're, you, you have a virus on your computer, okay? Computer virus and it's infected. By opening up the, 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 the machine and tightening the screws is also not going to fix the virus because it's a different conceptual level, right? So just simply having DNA and protein together doesn't mean you're going to have life either, okay? So, uh, and then there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rumor of some of them believe that there's a big soup, right, uh, that have all the ingredients. And so uh, this is... Um, so, so Fred Hoyt, right, he said that the chance that higher life forms might have emerged from this soup is comparable with the chance of a tornado sweeping through a junkyard to form the uh, 747 and, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I kind of want to qualify, right, that, um, that, that there is just simply no chance that this could have happened at all, right? There's just no chance. And while the evolutionists have their so-called rebuttal of these statistics, uh, they are not being truthful with themselves every time you use a PIN number or a password from being hacked. And what is, what is my, my, my point of showing you? So you see, for a virus to have so many genes, it's very rare. But what is very interesting is viruses also have overlapping genes, okay? Overlapping genes. So, for example, which means a single DNA can give rise to different RNA, okay? which means that if you mutate your DNA once, you can affect a lot of results, a lot of RNA. Okay, and if you have two very important genes happening, which gene should evolve and which should not? So I'm gonna show you a, an, an example, right? You saw the animation that the, the, some of these proteins go read your DNA and generate this RNA. Okay, so this is your RNA. And where they start, where they end, can result in different RNA transcripts. So this is kind of like the virus. Some viruses, humans do have it, but I'm going to use virus as an example. 
Viruses, they have they are very small, right? Because you saw the, the, the video, they are, I mean the comparison, they're extremely small. And because they're very small, they cannot have long. So they, they have overlapping genes. So they want to do as many things as they can within the same DNA strand, which is very smart of it. Um, and so you see, when you mutate one of these, you mutate across all the possible genes, right? I, I know it's a bit technical, but bear with me, right? So HIV, for example, it is very smart. So within, uh, say, a limited base pair, say, uh, 5,000 uh, gene, uh, 5,000 letters, A, G, C, T, it can make many ver different versions of the genes, right? They're overlapping. So when you mutate one, you don't, you actually affect two or more genes. And the more, and different viruses do have that, and many of them do have, you see, uh, the, for example, at the bottom for HIV, they overlap so much uh, that you just change one, it will affect everything else, right? So this is where the app comes in, right? You, you just type a random set of letters, A, G, C, T, you're gonna get what they call a different number, a different order of proteins below, right? These are represented in single letters. So basically, if you have words, you don't put the comma at the right place. You don't put the full stop at the right place. You are going to change the meaning of the words. Okay, just to put it. And then if you, if you shift out one word, you're gonna have a different order. So you can look at this and see how they can affect. So one point mutation has been known to affect pro, uh, diseases such as uh, sickle cell anemia, where the person has anemia. Um, because the, the, the very bad cells form, just by one letter change, okay, uh, it, has this, it has those effects. So the human body and the viruses, uh, human body also have overlapping genes. And this is an example that, uh, that someone has found, that 10% of mammalian genes, not just humans, have overlapping sequences. So you can see the example here, right? The, the DNA letter on the top, if you read it one way, you have the second letter, second row. You read it starting from somewhere else, you have a different code of letters. So this is a very unique coding system. Okay, it's almost as if a computer programmer programmed it. Right? And the problem is there are genes that are in that are very important where they are involved in tumor, right? How you get cancer, aging. And they are and they are also genes and it share and they and they share the same letters. So if you mute, if you want to evolve one gene, you will definitely impact the other. You get it? That's what that's that's my point. You cannot just mutate one, you cannot just evolve one without evolving the other. So a lot of these scientists, and this is 2014, I'm not talking about 20 years ago, this is just quite fairly fairly recent in terms of scientific disc um this this cause in that sense, right? Uh, the words are just novel, remarkable, striking, and statistically impossible. You cannot have evolution by random without affecting everything else. Okay, I, I know it's a bit heavy here, and, and, uh, but I hope you get the message that uh, you cannot change the letters in one uh, string of letters without affecting the whole multiple paragraphs and multiple sentences. Okay. And, and so uh, the key I want you to get is you look at the shape and viruses. You look at how they replicate, right? They are uniquely complex. If you're confused, it's good because you understood how complex it is, okay? And overlapping genes makes it even more impossible and it shows design, right? How can, how can a stupid chemical know to do two things at the same time? Right? You have to have intelligence behind that. That's, my, that's a key message. And so the viral life cycles requires many steps that have, that have to also follow a specific sequence. Bible Witness Media Ministry, a ministry of Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church, Singapore. Acts 1.8, and ye shall be witnesses unto me.